thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm Jen Dintel, and I'm from Gerberhart Library and Archives. Uh, welcome to our virtual event about Amigas Latinas. Um, I'm very excited to welcome Mona, Yvette, and Lourdes uh, to join our conversation with Amanda and Luis. Uh, Gerberhart is an LGBTQ library and archives located up in the Rogers Park neighborhood in Chicago. We've been around since 1981, and our collection focuses on the LGBTQ history of Chicago and the Midwest. And part of that history uh, includes our archives, and we were so fortunate back in 2015 that Mona and Yvette chose to donate uh, the Amigas Latinas collection to us, so that's part of our archives. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to a discussion about Amigas Latinas and about how the collection is currently being used by Luis and Amanda. A couple brief introductions, and then I'll drop full bios in the chat as well. So Mona Noriega, I don't know if you want to wave, Mona. <laughs> Perfect. Um, is a co-founder of Amigas Latinas, a recipient of Maldef's 2021 Lifetime Achievement, Excellence, and Community Service Award, and a longtime Chicago activist. And then Yvette Cardona in the same screen, um, also a co-founder of Amigas Latinas, a 2022 Chicago LGBT Hall of Fame inductee, and a lifelong Chicagoan. Uh, and then we have Lourdes Torres. Uh, right there. Um, and Lourdes is a professor of Latin American and Latino studies at DePaul University. She's the editor of the journal Latino Studies, and she served as a board member for Amigas Latinas and is currently working on a history of Diego. Um, Luis Benavides, down there, um, is a Latinx and queer video artist, photographer, and lecturer at Wilbur Wright College, City Colleges of Chicago. Working primarily with a range of personal archives, his work explores issues relating to gender and sexuality, culture and migration. Um, his his ex experimental documentary film, Lulu and El Jardon, um, tells the story of his lesbian mothers coming out in Chicago during the 1970s. And then Amanda Cervantes, last but not, not least, uh, is a queer visual artist, curator, and writer based in Chicago, Illinois. Their artistic practice focuses on queer temporalities, family histories, and the personal archive. Through archiving their family's ephemera, they build narratives around the conversations of familial mythologies, masculinity, and uncovering queer threads that run in their family. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to type it in the chat box um, or mention that you want to ask a question live during the Q&A. Um, and that's it. So I will leave it to Luis and Amanda to take over with the presentation. Thanks so much, Jen, and thanks to Gerber Hart, especially. Um, we're really honored to just be in the conversation with Mona, Yvette, and Lourdes. Um, these are really phenomenal leaders in the community, uh, scholars and experts in the field of the history of this organization, former board members you heard, and um, the organizers, the founders, right? But in terms of our curiosities of the archive and trying to figure out what it all means and why we're here and what we're doing with this archive, um, just hearing it straight from you all is straight in quotes, is, uh, is an honor, it's a blessing. So thank you. Uh, we are gonna share a bunch of slides with uh, questions that pertain to each kind of slide and its moment and a lot of moments in the history of the organization and specifically the Blaticas series, series, which if we're correct was a, a talking discussion based dinner based series that happened in, in, in women's homes throughout the city of Chicago um, for many years or the length of the organization. Um, and through those flyers, we can really see the story uh, of the organization, as Lutas said uh, to us prior. Um, we're again, just gonna ask questions as we go and hopefully that'll spark participation from the audience to, to, to share their stories um, and to more participation in other ways. Uh, so like what you're seeing here with these flyers, um, it's a gift that we made, Amanda and I, uh, to kind of capture the a conversation between gifts in the in the sense of flyers now and the flyers then um, we are, wanted to just stress that we are research based uh, queer research based and archive based artists um, we uh, with this specific flyer if you notice that we're redacting or hiding information uh, of people's sensitive information like addresses of their homes and phone numbers and things. Um, and that was also led into conversations about ethics in terms of the archive, like women that were not out, women that were uh, maybe went back into the closet and respecting identities and, and these uh, sort of intimate realities, right? So um, with that, we wanted to just thanks for this complete archive, its story and move on to the next slide. Mm -hmm. 
uh, this is a, a slide from um, my work, which I, was mentioned, I'm a video artist. And so I'm trying to engage the, the work in a, in a video capacity, making reenactment scenes of the life of the organization. In this uh, film still from a film I made in 2018, you see Amanda who's presenting with us, my collaborator, um, taking on the role of my mother, pretending or acting that she was my mother in the 1970s in her coming out story. Um, next slide. So this is an example of my work. Uh, like was mentioned in the bios, um, I am a photographer who works with um, my family's archive and ephemera. So um, what I primarily do is I um, extract gestures. And in this case, I was exploring kind of aspects of femininity. So this is me um, taking a family photograph and then expanding it and um, focusing in on these uh, gestures of hands. And then the next slide. So then our primary aim working with the archive is to honor and share Amigas Latinas legacy to younger generations of queer Latina people. And uh, by ways that we're doing that, we're going to be um, using like the existing ephemera and creating like artistic responses and transforming them. Um, and we are also interested in like uh, thinking about the flyers also as like pieces and also in addition, the photographs thinking about also ways that we can extract gestures and think of like honoring these uh, folks and honoring um, these moments in queer history, but also um, like we said, like protecting their identities at the same time. Um, so we also are interested in an open call for hand models of queer folks and Latinx folks um, for a uh, communal process of making where we will um, kind of stage these uh, stage photographs as a way to um, as a way to respond to the archive. So with this idea of the restaged photographs that we are going to do and this invitation through this dialogue and through you, know, you getting in contact with us later uh, to participate in the project, we are aiming to, um, as I'll just kind of read this, as artists working with creative responses to the ephemera of this archive, uh, culminating in staged photographs, framing queer Latina, Latina hands, making and mailing and holding. Um, we just learned not posting because these are, these flyers were never posted anywhere um, and passing these uh, select amigas flyers between members, right? Our, we're trying to, we want to in the future envision staging these photographs uh, as a way to highlight the intimate touch between queer women and the materiality of the flyers themselves, um, the tactile quality of them, the ephemeral, ephemerality of these objects, passing them back and forth, promoting each event, um, and the manual labor that went into making these, uh, literally standing around a copy machines or Xerox machines, um, and the mass mailings of these flyers, which we've learned, is the way that they were circulated. Um, next slide. So just to really briefly, and this is going to start our questions to, to Lourdes, Mona, and Yvette. Um, very briefly, we know that Yena was a sort of uh, impetus for Amigas Latinas, an organization that, found, that was founded prior to um, and paved the way. So we're just wondering a little bit about if you could tell us what was Yena and in a specific moment that we think is interesting for folks or might be interesting for folks, some actions that Yena was engaged in is particularly um, protesting some bars and dance nights in, in Chicago. And why, uh, why were you all doing that? And uh, what were the bars and things that you were, that you were in protest with or, or working you, with? You, you know, I would, I would never think about Yena being the impetus for Amigas. I think those were two, uh, two separate chapters in life here in the city of Chicago. Um, so I, would, I, I wouldn't think that one led to the other. Uh, there were some, you know, I did participate in Yena, and I would not cate categorize it as a uh, political protest. I think that was more about the celebration of art, culture and art. Uh, and so that was more about uh, being reflective of each other's art and spirituality and who we are, affirm affirmations, um, theoretical reasoning or, you know, just trying to figure out who we were, where, where we fit in the world. 
Um, so I would think it would, it would be more, I would define it as more focused on art. And, and I, uh, I would say that there were, uh, in this group, there were other, there were many more, there were many other women who were leaders, but I think that I was introduced to it uh, through Marilyn Morales and maybe Carmen Abrego, I think, uh, yeah. But what were these moments with the bars specifically? Like there were some, uh, some, some issues with the bars that were happening that I think you're talking about in terms of art and culture and celebration, but like not, not seeing oneself represented in these bars or like what were the specific moments that triggered these, these kind of not political actions, but well, yeah. these, these you know what, I, I don't remember actually Yana doing. Uh, maybe uh, I can add something here from based on interviews with uh, Amparo, who was uh, one of the leaders of, you know, uh, of uh, Yena. She told a story of how when um, after the meetings of Yena, the, the women would go to bars, the, the bars would not play Latino music. And so uh, here are all these women, all these Latinas were coming to the, the, the bars and the nightclubs and they weren't being um, respected, they felt. And so they took it upon themselves to talk to the, um, the bar owners, um, to, uh, to bring their own music, uh, to insist that the bars get Latina music. So they actually um, provided a space for Latinas to engage with their music on their space in places where they were spending their dollars. So, I, I, you know, in, in some respects, I think um, um, that was a very political uh, move. And Absolutely. Was, and that's different from protests. So in Chicago, we did have protests at bars for carding, but that was more around African American women. So what you're what Lourdes is describing is more of a dialogue, a more friendship, a more relationship based kind of uh, action. So certainly that was a demanding of space and recognition. And we were spending our dollars and we were having such a good time. We were, and we, we brought such goodwill to each of these bars. And so we thought it was important. But when you said uh, protesting bars, that there actually is a history in Chicago of that, but that was more around, uh, not to say that Latinas didn't participate in it, they did, but it was uh, more in response to some African-American women who had been carded, you know, been carded. I guess it's also interesting to, to as, as we talk to folks from the organization, um, I, 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 I'm speaking now in, in terms of some of the research I have done both on Yena and Amigas, that people remember things differently. Yeah, uh, it's been, It was a long time ago and uh, some people have one perspective on what the organizations were about or what some of the activities were and other people will talk about the same exact uh, happening in totally different ways and have a totally different memory of it. And so I think we have to remember that as we look at the past and think about the past that it's fun to see members of Amigas on, on this, um, you know, participants and I'm sure every one of them will have a different story to tell or different memories about all these events. And I think that's what makes it beautiful, all these different stories coming together and us asking what was it? And it was all these things, it wasn't just one. It was, you know, all these memories and all these stories, which I think is really beautiful. Yeah, and and I would say that, again, I don't I don't want to step back from the politicalness of it, uh, because uh, I always I think that we always felt that just surviving mm -hmm. and claiming space was a political act, and then to layer on top of that to create art to be able to say your poetry and have someone listen and value it, respond to it in a way that you had hoped, that is a political act, absolutely. And so there was, so it was very political in that particular way, absolutely. But I wanna say that there was also a lot of creativeness around artists um, and, an, and a willingness of peers to, to say, I'm hungry for this art. I'm hungry to hear these words and I'm hungry to see you and be seen in a way that validates me versus, 
you know, maybe when you go home or, you know, some other context. Yeah, I remember one time somebody said to, to me or about Amigas, it's like, why does Amigas have to be so political? <laughs> I was like, huh? Like, I felt we hadn't done a political thing, <laughs> you know, just trying to create safe space for women to explore their identities. Like, why well, you gotta be so political? And then I realized it was because, you know, the personal is political and just the fact that we were putting that stake in the ground and that flag that said, Amigas Latinas, you know, celebrating who we are without apology and all that was like a political thing to people that were just like, stop. And I was like, hmm, okay, well, we're still gonna have that picnic. <laughs> And you know what, let me just say one other thing about politics, because e even though I, I, I tend to think of Yena as more as something that was fostering m my personal growth. You know, actually, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, Alderman Gutierrez marched with Yena. Mm -hmm. They mar he mar he so he uh, was a Puerto Rican uh, alderman who was a supporter of the gay, what was then called the gay rights bill. Now it's mm -hmm. called the human rights, you know, Morgan ordinance here in the city of Chicago, but he, but you, you know, in, in that regard, yes, it was amazingly political. Oh my God. He was so associated with uh, Puerto Rico and independence. And here he was like stepping up for gay rights at a time when, you know, people were just aghast. He marched in the gay pride parade with a Yena t-shirt with us. He marched with us in the gay pride parade. So yeah, you're right. It was very political. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you were trying to express the place of Mendes. And I wasn't trying to like say you were a woman of political organization. It just read to me that like, wow, that's an incredible moment in history. Yeah. Because there's so many queer yeah. Latin You're absolutely right. And like yeah, there's so many things now for our generation. That. Right. That we don't have we didn't have to to think of a moment of somebody. And and, the, and these racist moments and these things continue to happen too. So it's not like, you know, sunshine and lollipops at forever after. Uh, but right, I think we do. I just relate to that that story in a lot of different ways too. Uh, if we can go to the next slide and talking about politics and tr like the transformation of of, uh, of uh, amigas Latinas, um, how did the the newsletters, the flyers, these mailers, uh, how did they come out? How did they come to be? And um, yeah, we could just talk about the mailing. And yeah, the well, let, you know, let me just back up a little bit. I mean, first of all, thank you so much for having this conversation for inviting Mona and me and Lourdes and I, I, I want to recognize so a couple things Mona and Yvette did not make the decision to donate the archives right Amigas Latinas did granted they were like in my basement and I had I was the keeper of the large three ring binders two of them or three of them but really it was a collective decision to do that right because there's a lot of places you can donate archives and we felt Gerber Hart was the place to do that I also want to recognize it's a beautiful thing to see um some of the original board members that are on Norma uh Celedon Lydia Vega Alma Esquerdo um Lourdes, Lourdes um Rosa Ortiz Alicia Vega um and Sofia Ursula, love senior Ursula, Dina is on, um, there might be others that I'm missing, and Zaida is also on, who helped to start Amiguitas. Um, so, you know, when I was coming out, I was a late bloomer, and when I finally came out, and it was with the Whacked Brunches, Women of All Colors and Cultures Together, um, and it was through the Whacked Brunches that met on the first Sundays of the month that I started to meet you know, Latina lesbians, that's what I was looking for, and Whacked was, you know, had an organizing circle of four of us, uh, African American, I see Phyllis Johnson is on. She was a founder of that. Um, Marilee Snyder, myself, and um, Claire Wang, who was from mainland China. And, it, it, you know, through that, I met enough um, Latinas that about a year later, um, and WAC is still happening, absolutely. About a year later in 1995, somebody at a, at a brunch said, Why don't we do this for us? And I always say, That's my window of opportunity where we you know, said, let's do this. And so about 15 of us sort of started it. Um, and the newsletters I think came about because when whacked brunches um, uh, were happening or you know, back in the early days, it, it, they grew so large, 60, 70 women that there was no discussion. It maybe the first three brunches had discussions with a topic, but then it just got so big. It just became about sort of breaking bread and the model was a girl's gotta eat. 
and people would just bring, right lesbians got to have potlucks all the time and so that's what we did and we just ate and and were in community and we would make announcements right and though in those announcements Merrily started gathering them into a newsletter right so then when amigas met and i'll never forget the little blurb that was in the newsletter said you know amigas latinas looking to start a group and so that's how the name came about and so we just continued the newsletter but because we were a smaller group we always had a topic to discuss right so that the platicas that was the the, the thrust of it there was always something to talk about along with the brunches along with sharing food um, and so whatever was happening at the brunches, whatever announcements were being made, would just get pulled into the newsletters because the newsletter became the opportunity to share information, both fun, informative, um, educational. Um, and it, you know, we would always then put the newsletter in and create a flyer for the next topic that was often chosen by the women at that platica for the next one also deciding who's going to host it. And that's how it started to travel around the city, much as the WAC brunches did. Um, and we decided to meet on the third Sundays of the month. Simone and I would be running around the first Sunday of the month were the WAC brunches. The third Sundays of the month were the Amigas brunches, which you know really started to take up a lot of the energy in that um, as that grew. And we grew to about three, 300, 350 names on, on a mailing list, right? And so, yeah, we would just, we would not advertise because we were meeting in women's homes. It was a privilege and an honor to be invited into a woman's home, especially Latina, queer. Um, and we didn't, you know, so there was a safety issue of not wanting, you know, not putting it out there that everybody show up at, you know, Mercedes and Candy's house on the third Sunday of, you know, October to talk about sex, you know, so that's how those came about. and and that really became the communication tool and word of mouth and, you know, women that would host something would then invite their friends, right? Often queer, other queer Latinas who maybe would join the mailing list um, or not. They may be like, hey, cool, I'm just here because, you know, because, you know, Maria's hosting. I'm, I, I don't got to, I don't got to champion the flag, you know, I'm good. Um, but that's how it grew. And there was um, there's a question now, and I might combine this slide with the next slide too. Uh, everyone kind of saw that this was a very like working, uh, working class sort of iteration of one of the talks, the platicas. If we go to the next slide too, and I'll just combine. Yeah, that slide was we we did a we did a a workshop with Chicago Women in Trades, which is an important long time organization in Chicago, right around right, construction jobs, opportunities. So that was just a way that Amigas would partner with other nonprofits to, again, you know, share education. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of work there on the ground uh, to organize these. Um, and so I'll just couple these questions together regarding immigrant uh, communities of which we're from sometimes, and also uh, this working class focus. And so how did you all if you think, can think of any moments or ways that you uh, worked with immigrant rights and also uh, work to make this a safe space for focusing on everyday women's stories and, and dialogue. Um, you know what, I think I want to go back to the question about how did we, uh, how did we work with other community groups? So um, around the time that uh, when Lourdes was talking about uh, Latina women demanding space and music, that was a real important part of development here in Chicago. Now it's commonplace everywhere, but at a certain point that there was none. And so around the same time, we began to do something called the International Women's Day Dance. And the International Women's Day Dance was an opportunity to, uh, to be in solidarity with all different groups. And so we had an at women's academic group, we had Amigas Latinas, we had a, a um, it was called Literary Exchange, which was an African-American group. Um, and then we had Women in Trades. And so this, this, was a, this was a way that we could be in solidarity with other women of different groups. And it wasn't just always about race with, you know, the Women in Trades and academic women had, were also multi, interested in multi-perspectives, uh, right? Um, and we controlled the music. We hired the DJ. Yeah, they did. And we partied on, and it, and it was all ours. And the, 
then the proceeds we would all put in money, each each of the groups would put in money, and then the ticket sales uh, would then go back out in, in, to the amount of effort that a group sold tickets or whatever. And and I guess from the conversations with folks um, who uh, participated in the international women's dances. In order to be one of those co-sponsors, 75% of the people in the organization had to be women of color. So I think that's really important to identify that this was women of color run, organized, and it was for women of color. And an interesting thing people talked about in terms of, of these events, one of the things that was a controversy was whether or not men would be allowed to the dances. And uh, so there were often a lot of discussions about that. And um, uh, one thing someone told me was that um, they wanted their money in terms of donations. So what they, uh, they decided that they, they were invited but not encouraged to come, <laughs> which I think was uh, a, a funny way of doing it. But ultimately the group did decide that um, men would be welcome because the people have brothers and um, you know, friends who were supportive of, of women of color and of, um, of, of Latina lesbians. So, um, there were, um, at, at some point, there were uh, men who were also invited to the dances, even though it was the International Women's Day dance. I think that those discussions came later. Initially, it was just, it was just us trying to uh, be in solidarity with each other. Mm -hmm. And it was about c controlling the music. <laughs> <laughs> It ran for a long time. The girls got to eat, and you yeah. control the music, and you know it was good. really about controlling the music. Well, yeah. and that's what it was about. But but you know this whole exclusion and affinity thing, right, is important because I would often get asked, you know, why does there have to be just a group for Latina lesbians? And it's like, you know, it's not about exclusion, right? It's about affinity, and I don't mean affinity community services, but I mean about affinity, about creating space to be sort of with your own, to explore your own identity. I mean, I know many you know, women on, on the call are like, you would walk the world either being Latina or either being queer, but not both. And Amigas Latinas provided that space to do that. And you didn't have to explain it. You didn't have to, you know, and trust me, I always said, you could get 10 Puerto Rican lesbians in a room and you got differences. You still got cultural differences happening. You know, um, you, you said about the immigration stuff. I mean, when, you know, when we started it, right? Like I was born and raised in Chicago at a time when you didn't really speak Spanish. You learned English, you know, you, you acculturated and, you know, so I got a lot of baggage around the Spanish language as women started to find us like we were it right so we would get Spanish dominant Spanish monolingual, um, you know, women who were like third, fourth, fifth generation Latina um, or Hispanic right, uh, and then you would have women who came like three to six months ago. And they found Amigas because they found this thing that said Amigas Latinas for queer Latina women who love women. And they would come to us. So we just figured it out. So, you know, we, we this flyer, you know, there was a queer immigration alliance that started to form that was a result of Senator Sensenbrenner, is that his name, I think, you know, around the political stuff they were doing around immigration. And it's like, what did that mean for queer immigrants, right? Whether, you know, you, whether you were born here and your partner wasn't, whether you were both, you know, from another country. And that's how we partnered with organizations to maybe push a little bit more of the political agenda. Um, and it was a pretty amazing thing to do because, you know, Chicago has a vibrant queer community and it has for decades. And it was through things like, this was called CLIA, uh, WACT, um, the color purple. Uh, that, you know, we got to really know each other, talk about our differences, celebrate those differences and challenge each other. Um, yeah. yeah. But, and then later on though, the immigration, the organizing, I, I think Julio was on the call and we, uh, we had been part of an immigration, um, uh, I don't know what to call it. And we were holding organizations responsible for including gay and p gay people in there because you know you know we all know the horrors of immigration but as as po politicians were beginning to talk about um, lending support to the issue they were 
and particularly willing to give up LGBTQ people and, yeah. not, and not protect them. And so here in Chicago, when it, you know, we, sometimes we would go to these uh, immigration meetings and we'd be the only people who would, you know, who would stand for queer. And people just couldn't, you know, it was so difficult to have a conversation around immigrants that, you know, people did not want to have that added right, layer to it. immigration wasn't a queer issue, right? And so we were claiming that, of course, it's, a, you know, queers are, right. are part of this. And so there were lots, there were lots of iterations and developments of how how we organized here in Chicago around the issue of immigration. And I want to give a shout out to Latinos Progresando and mm -hmm. ICER, Illinois Coalition Immigrant Refugee Rights, I think who really started to recognize that you cannot separate a queer immigrant, queer Latino from those identities and started to literally just say the word. I mean, that was just so powerful, right? It's like, girls got to eat, play your own music and just say the word lesbian for God's sake. I mean, right? For for Latino serving organizations to talk about, you know, not just, you know, Latina women, but Latina queer women, and not just legal services for Latino immigrants, but Latino queer immigrants, Latino queer immigrants, yeah, just to say the word was just so powerful. And you could almost hear that collective gasp in the room. So I give a shout out to, you know, Latinos Progresando, Mujeres Latinas. It was a little more work with them, but they're, you know, they, they are there for us. Um, you know, and, and that's where, you know, a lot of our education work used to happen. We would, we would do workshops, you know, our little $40,000 organization would be training, you know, $2 million organization staff on, you know, this is what a queer Latina looks like, you know, and we would haul Mary Torres, our, you know, at the time, our 65 year old queer Puerto Rican grandma, who was a deacon at her church to say, yeah, I'm queer, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm a grandmother, and I, you know, I give up communion. You know, Ike, anybody got a question? Can, can we like keep moving on, right? Yeah, that's, a, that's a perfect segue to the next slide. Um, regarding familia and trying to figure out how common it was and how there's this, this intergenerational um, you know, queerness in, in families. How popular, how, how often did those stories come up where someone was either a mother to a queer child or in, like in my case where I'm queer and my mother is also queer or that you have someone older, you know, that your aunt or your tia or your abuela is, you find out is queer or you always know we're queer. How, how often did, were those stories? I think that's super fascinating. Well, um, you know what, For when we were organizing, most of us had children. And so there were a lot of women who were either still married or recently divorced or long-term divorce and the children arose out of a heterosexual kind mm -hmm. of union. Mm -hmm. And so actually there were a lot of women mm -hmm. when we were, or and it, now it could be that, you know, I was a mom. And so of course I'm going to be social with other women who were mom. I mean, actually that was one of my primary things when I came out was to find other women who were like me. Um, so that I could help normalize uh, what it meant to be queer and have children for my children's sake. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, so a lot of the women had children. Had children already, yeah. And when I first came out, a lot of women didn't even come out to their children, you know? And so it was, it was such a secret, it was such a burden. Uh, it was so life, you could, the risk was high. When I came out, the risk was so high in terms of coming out um, that I knew women who actually lost their children in custody battles and whose mothers would testify against their own daughter because it was so wrong for you to be, to claim your sexual identity. So it was often a secret uh, that uh, women had children or if they lost them, that, you know, that was a secret as well. <clears throat> yeah, and I think that this this flyer, I think Norma Celedon is on the phone, and 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 I remember it was her children, I think, along with uh, I think Valerie's son, who were our guest speakers, <laughs> you know, to talk about. So your mom's queer, like, what's it like, you know, when they came out to you? Because we had a lot of women, yes, who were mothers. We had women who were married to men, right, and had girlfriends and would come. And so this was a really important topic because of the fear of coming out to children. They may be out sort of in the community, 
maybe, maybe at work, but coming out to their kids. And so we wanted to normalize it. And so we would have these platicas of this, you know, your mom, your aunt, your grandma's gay. Um, and we would have the picnics where it was just like, you know, just to come and be with other kids and to see that we were kind of be like, you know, boring just as well, I guess, but not really. Um, but, you know, we would have, you know, the kids be the guest speakers. It was one of the most powerful platicas that we would do. And, you know, Norma could share some of that if I think we can go to the next slide that actually ties into um, uh, talking about these um, powerful platicas and then like in our conversations uh, previous to this, this um, that uh, this platica in particular has been like a really poignant one. And um, I just uh, wanted to see if you guys can talk about, um, I guess like challenges and unique moments of talking about like um, race, class and culture and um, in like the 90s and the early 2000s. Sorry, we had to we had to like figure out like what what what, 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 what which part which which thing you want to talk about on this? Yeah, one? so you know, so I think you know with with this with this um, platica, and it speaks to right when people would say, why do you have to form a group right just for Latina lesbians? And it's because even within that you know sort of subgroup. Right, there was a lot of difference and a lot of, you know, racism and classism. I mean, when I finally came out, right, which wasn't until I was like 32, 33, to then discover that there's racist shit going on in the queer community, I was like, are you kidding me? It took me this long to come out and you're telling me that this is like same shit, different sexual orientation? Oh my God. Okay. And then I get to Amiga Sadinas and it's like, are you kidding me? Same shit like now with us. And so, you know, we wanted to talk about it and culture, racism, classism, you know, the language stuff, right? Again, you know, I, I remember one amiga who, you know, came like six months, didn't speak English and she'd be like, why don't you just call yourself um, Latin friends instead of amigas latinas because you're always talking English. And it's like, oh dear God, okay. So, you know, we have to explain like what it means, right, to be a Latina lesbian born in Chicago in 1962, right, versus coming to Chicago six months ago, right? And this is a beautiful thing. I love that I have the year on here, 1999, right? It's just like, always put the year on your flyer, folks, because, you know, it's an archive thing, right? So 1999. <laughs> Right, so let's go back there. And I remember this was a powerful discussion. There was probably 35 Latinas in a room, right? We do our thing, we'd eat first, and then we all like gather around with the chairs and the couches and all that. And we start talking and, you know, some, some amigas can't figure out like, well, what are you talking about like racism and, you know, classism, what are we talking, you know, that I'll never forget, probably like 15 minutes into the conversation, there's a knock at the door, open up the door, there's a black woman standing there. And I could tell, you know, it's kind of like, you know, until she says, you know, hola, you know, que tal, you know, like, I'm sorry I'm late in Spanish and all that. And then it was like, oh, she's black and she's Latina and she's queer and she speaks Spanish. Then it was like, come on in. And I think we unpacked that in the discussion. And let me tell you, I, I don't know if like the goddesses just said, <laughs> let's, let's concretize and operationalize what you're talking about and had her come in the door. I'll never forget that Carmen was her name. And um, it was a beautiful thing. And, you know, it's just like, this is what we're talking about, you know? And, you know, we would have at other instances about, you know, those illegal, right? Mexican um, queers versus, you know, so we just always the platicas were about safe space. We always had to have our, you know, guidelines that, you know, all opinions, you know, you know sort of matter and, and we gotta listen to each other and challenge each other because you know we are not the same, right? We are the same in that we love women. We are the same in that we have Latina heritage. But you know, let's explore, you know, um, kind of what that really means that intersection. Yeah, uh, Sheree Moraga has a, a phrase. She talks about theory in the flesh, and that's really what was happening at these meetings. Uh, the women were developing their own theory of their lives. And that was really powerful. They didn't really uh, have a, any other spaces where they could do this safely, talk to people, their own peer group. And everybody were experts in their own lives. 
and they were forming the theory of who they were as uh, individuals and as communities. And it was really powerful to have, uh, you know, these women working out their own lives and how they intersected with uh, the outside world and um, how to feel good about themselves and understand what they were contributing. That was all beautifully, you know, worked out with each with each of those um, platicas. I'm reading a uh, Gloria Antaldúa's book on uh, interviews, entrevistas, mm -hmm. and it, it covers some of the uh, interviews that she had given during this time period. And it reminds, and, and so the issue of how raw uh, the classism uh, and racism, even within, you know, cultures. Uh, I'm, so it's so funny that I'm reading this, mm -hmm. A reflection back with uh, Gloria Anzaldúa talking what her words were at this time, and then here you say Sheree Moraga as well. Yes. Okay, can we move on to the next slide? Um, so I know that uh, this um, this platica in particular, and then um, furthering the question, I guess it's like how did the group address um, address trans visibility, and then like I especially like as the um, as the organization organization grew and like incorporating like like the T basically in like LGBTQ and um like what were some of the um what were some of the things that you guys had to um like work around talk about and address well Sebastian was a blessing in in that regard yeah that's who's pictured here Sebastian Colon activist who's in New York now um so, so, you know, when Amigas first started, I mean, it's funny, the first names, and I just don't know if it, where it's got to appear somewhere, was Amigas Latinas Lesbianas Bisexuales, right? Just to get that across. <laughs> Let me tell you, one of the other hardest platicas we had was talking about bisexuality. That was probably harder than race, class, and culture, and even transgender, because, <laughs> man, that was like, right? Because then some women started to identify as bisexual, and it was like, what? <sighs> So, so, you know, we, we then just would use Amigas Latinas. And, you know, I guess the way we approached transgender at the beginning was, well, if you were transgendered woman and you identified as a lesbian, then you could belong to Amigas, right? I mean, there were a lot of trans women, one in particular um, that I remember who was very much a part of, of, of um, in the community. But again, right? gender identity is not sexual orientation, right? And so this particular woman, um, Ginger, right? Ginger, uh, Ginger, I can't remember her last name, sorry. You know, she would be like with the Alma uh, men's group, right? And because she didn't identify as a lesbian, she was a Latina trans woman, she didn't identify as a lesbian. So to me, she didn't come to Amigas, right? But we did have a Latina trans woman come to Amigas who identified as a lesbian it was beautiful, but it was never talked about and acknowledged that she was trans. And when I look back on, right, my history with Amigas, it's one of the regrets I have that we were all about sort of safe space. And whereas I think she was safe and nobody like, like didn't welcome her and she was welcomed and she participated in the discussions and everything. But right in those early days, like gender identity didn't come up. And, and, you know, she eventually moved from Chicago because as a trans woman, right, when it was found out, right, that she was trans, it would make her life hard, right, through her work, through whatever, and she would move on to another city. And I always just regretted that it wasn't acknowledged that part of her, right, when we were all about acknowledging all the identities, right, that we held, right, in our heart. Um, so, so when we made the decision that we have to do more about the T, um, a lot of it came about that there was a powerful workshop we did called um, the uh, Tacones y Corbatas, right, from Heels to Ties. And Sebastian, before they transitioned, and their girlfriend, who identified as a power femme, and Sebastian was a butch, did this workshop to talk about the power dynamics of butch femme, right? Which is a whole other discussion that was going on in, I'd say, queer women of color spaces. 
Um, and it was a powerful workshop. And from that, as Sebastian was transitioning, would say to us, as amigas, you're it. You're the group, right, for queer Latinas, right? And at the time, we weren't even saying queer, right? It was Latina lesbian. You're it for queer Latinas. You have to create space for trans Latinas, Latinos. Until there are multiple other groups, you're it. And so it was a real education process for the board to sort of do that. And he helped us as he was transitioning to be willing to talk about what it meant to be, you know, what he said, um, it wasn't um, uh, F to M, right? Female to male, it was F to S, female to something else, he said because he knew that, right, he was in that space that I guess we now say non-binary, genderqueer. Um, and so we had a, we had a, and we had women members who were like, why are we talking about trans? Like, I don't get this. It's supposed to be a lesbian group, right? And it's like, well, look, this is what we're talking about. If you don't want to come, okay. You know, we even had a board member one time say, if we put the T in the mission, I don't know if I can be on the board. And I was like, well, and Lourdes tells the story that it was a bit of a top-down decision, and I will own that. But it was like, well, we're doing this, and if you can't be a part of that or affirm that or be okay with that, then this isn't the board for you. Um, I think it, I think it also it wasn't uh, I, uh, you know Sebastian pushing was really helpful, but after in the later years. Uh, people didn't just identify as lesbian or bisexual. People started identifying as queer. Um, and, and actually it was uh, a queer identified Latina, as I recall, Nicole Perez, who really pushed us as a board to take this up, to have platicas on this issue, to engage in this conversation because she felt it was really important to get that tea in there. And, and yeah, I, I do remember that it was, I remember some of those platicas, which were very contentious and some of the, the women did not think it was a good idea. They said, what about trans men? Are they part of Amigas Latinas mission now? What does the mission mean if all of a sudden we're opening it up to all these different categories? Mm -hmm. I think at, at, with the, as the years progressed and people started identifying in different ways, it really caused Amigas to reevaluate the mission, to think about you know, who we were representing. And I, and I do recall that even though there wasn't a, um, a, a consensus about adding that to that T, we as the board understood that there, we had to do that and we did do it and we changed the flyers and we changed all the, um, you know, the, uh, the information on Amigas to put that T in there. And I, you know, it was the right thing to do. And I think it opened up the, the group to uh, different conversations and different people and, and made us a better organization. Yeah, and, and I just, and just to add that, that reminds me that, you know, Mona and I represent sort of the first generation of leadership, I would say. And so, you know, Gerber Hart, it would be good for you all to like do this again with like sort of the second generation leaders and certainly the third generation, because you're right those conversations at the board level in platicas were very different than what we were doing at the beginning, right? I mean, we were, I, I remember those going through that where, yeah, we don't use the word lesbian anymore. It's like, okay, you know, you have no idea how we fought to get that word, but okay, you know, so just want to recognize the, the, the those generations. Okay, we can move on to the next slide. Um, and then I can also combine this slide with the following slide, which is also um, about the softball team. But initially this, um, so this question that I have is about like what strides did Amigas Latinas take in addressing the mental health concerns of queer Latinas in Chicago, um, which like mental health, um, like mental health amongst like, uh, like Latinx people in general, like that, like as a convert, like I know that in my family, that was like a struggle to have a conversation about that. But then like furthering that, like through like these like recreation things, like um, were these some of the things that I guess like, were they um, like addressing these concerns, but then also like having these like um, re recreational moments, these like, um, like forming teams and, and like going to um, like, like I guess forming community and like having like 
parties and stuff like that. Like, um, you know, I, I think, I think that you have to, yeah. you have to put these in, in a timely order because those yeah. are two very different kinds of iterations. And mm -hmm. so I would say, so that's the first thing. So these two, those two, the importance of those two things were relevant for the time period that they were mm -hmm. in. And so I would say that the forming a baseball team, again, softball was such a big lesbian thing, but you never had an, a baseball, you know, a softball team that was just all Latinas. Okay. And so that was so important just together. The mental health thing was incredibly important. Yeah, could you go back to one slide? But that, so, yeah. so I, I would just break them up that those yeah. were two very separate time periods and they were both very relevant for the time, the years that they happened in. If I could address this slide, because this, I want to shout, give a shout out to um, Alicia Vega, yeah. who spearheaded this Proyecto Latina, which was so important to Amigas Latinas. And she, she, she got the funding, she got um, uh, a bunch of people who knew how to do surveys to, to, uh, to work on this project. It was huge. It uh, ultimately we surveyed three over 300 participants, 300 uh, queer Latina identified people filled out this very long survey and gave us access to information on the on the queer Latina community, which never existed before. This level of of information over 300 women and um, with questions on all issues, you can see some of them on the flyer, parenting, citizenship, discrimination and violence. And, and not only was this survey really important, but what we ourselves did with the information was address a lot of the issues that came up because now we had the information that um, we had um, um, uh, people, if you look at the health um, column here, 15% of the women um, uh, talked about being anxious, 70 27 about having depression, 40% about having suicidal thoughts. So we had a real understanding of some of the mental health issues that women were, were facing. And so the subsequent platicas became around those issues. And I remember there were two amigas who were social workers around domestic violence issues so they created a series of platicas around um, violence within Latina lesbian communities, which goes back to the idea about theories of, of the flesh. I mean, this was a community that did everything. We got the information we needed to, to find out what the, the, um, the Latinas um, needed. And then we provided what was needed because nobody else was doing it. And I think that that's really important that we were our own experts and that the people who participated and gave the information were ourselves, people from within the community. So we were teaching and learning together. And maybe one day you're the expert, but the next day you need the information. And I think at, you know that was beautiful how all of this came from within the community itself. That's right. That first flyer, was but the it? first fly. So the flyer, right? The issues on mental health and culturation. Actually, I believe that because it's in quotas, that is the title of the dissertation mm -hmm. of Anna. You see, at the home yeah. of Elba and Anna. Anna was a PhD in psychology or something, and she. So she early on did some of the first uh, research on you know issues of mental health, and we had a platica where she presented her her research to you know to the women, um, and and so the mental health stuff. I mean, as a trained social worker myself, from the get go, it was really important for me in terms of creating safe space and the power of groups, right? Of I wouldn't even say that Amigas was a support group. We didn't, I didn't think of it that way. There were support groups that spun off and would be very specific around that. Some were also Spanish speaking only, which was an important thing, but, but that our Latikas, right, were more like discussion groups, but the mental health aspect was really important. Not just, you know, mental health in general, but we had a lot of alcohol and drug abuse in the community. So we had, you know, women who were sober, um, right, who would, as sort of guest speakers, queer Latinas, again, sort of tell their story and their journey, right, in the ongoing battle. So 
you know, just recognizing the importance of, you know, mental health and depression and that, right, as, as a Latino community, we don't talk about that the stigma. We just wanted to, like, get that out, that let's talk about it. So, and the fact that the Proyecto Latina, then that information came, you know, that research project came out of it. I mean, that was, that is one of the, the best things, you know, Bamiga's legacy that we've ever done. And softball. You're, you wouldn't say that the baseball, the softball team was the best thing you ever did? No. <laughs> well, somebody asked in the chat, like, was it competitive? Yeah. Uh, um, yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, very competitive. It was very, very competitive. No, yeah, we weren't that good. Um, but that doesn't mean it wasn't competitive. But this is true. Thank you. And competitive is relative, right? So, I mean, look at those t-shirts, right? Those are badass t-shirts, man. I forgot about those. I loved seeing this image and that. Yeah, so we had, I remember Liz, who had owned a cleaning company, sponsored the team. And it was at the lakefront. And we just had such a blast. I wasn't on the team. Um, but, you know, that's not like a whole other subculture, right? You could have like, you could have like a Latina, queer, softball, da, 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 you know. Um, you could just like keep going, right? And have all these groups. So yeah, we had the team, I don't know, three, four years, maybe, four, whatever, I don't know. So how good are you? <laughs> all right, you're gonna make me say, Luis, we sucked. Okay, we sucked, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, well, well, tell them the story. When they got the oh, the, so I remember we were at one of the games and like, we, we were so bad that when, the team we were playing like hit a fly ball and somebody in left field like actually caught the ball everybody applauded like even their team applauded it was too damn funny i mean it was really funny we were really that bad now i don't know if any of the softball players are on the call so you can you know maybe maybe that was just that game but we weren't that good <laughs> says the person who was on the sidelines right but it was fun and it was all part of what can amigas right provide to the community Right. I mean, and this is, you know, so we had support for specific to really be about supporting what that model does. We had, you know, picnics. We had, you know, the softball team. Um, you know, we would have real deal Fridays. Like, who the hell has an educational like workshop on a Friday night? Right. Like we do. Like we can't have them on, you know, Monday through Thursday. Like that didn't happen because everybody was like at home with their family and their kids and just trying to get through the day or get through the week. But come Friday, Real Deal Fridays or Viernes de Veritades, it was called, right? Have a topic. And then everybody would go to Stargaze and party, right? And then on Sunday, we'd like have a platica. It's just like we were doing it all. And, you know, it was really fortunate that I think, you know, the board and the organizers, you know, boundaries, right? Was an interesting thing. But I think we recognized that, I remember the moment, like, you know, I don't know, don't, Luis is going to say, what is that moment? But I remember when, you know, we realizing that you're organizing with your friends, but then suddenly the group is more than just about you. And there's a responsibility and an obligation, right, to that, to be real and authentic to the community. And I will always say that, you know, we always were. Now, there might be other stories, right, because history is from the person who says it. But, you know, you know, to me, we were just, you know, ignorance was bliss, maybe, right? We were just doing it and responding and trying to do the best that we could at a, at a time that is very different from now, very different from now. And, you know, in terms of organizing, our, our first board, I think, just broke all the rules because there were like three couples. And? And, and no. I... I <laughs> Yeah, that's true. We did I, I, have three couples on the board of, there was a board of eight and six of them were partnered. <laughs> <laughs> so we broke a lot, uh, you know, a lot of the, or, but, 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 we did good. but I, I have to say we weren't sleeping with each other. So, you know, that, you know, unlike in some of their boards, I see, I see Jorge Felix is laughing and laughing. But that is true. We were not. <laughs> we were just sleeping with each other. Like, yeah. Yeah. Couples, yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Next. Okay. Next. next I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> quick, quick. I just, I just want to, I just. I just want to jump in real fast. We are just past three o'clock. I want to make sure we have some time for audience questions. I know Luis and Amanda, there's a couple more slides, but just, we have had a couple come in through the chat. I want to read. So just, just putting that out there. Do you want me to go to the next slide? Well, yeah. Whatever you want to do. Sure. Um, so then I guess, so for, um, since this group is born out of a need for advocacy, social community needs, 
um, how did things like these like arts events come in and like um, get it like these conversations like uh, Sherry Moraga and like these film screenings? Yeah, I mean, again, it was, you know, filling the need of what women wanted in the community, right? Like some wanted to come on that third Sunday of the month and, you know, talk about the heavy topics and some were like, just wanted to socialize. And so we created movie nights, right? Just to have women be able to do that, right? Um, you know, Sheree Moraga had come, I think, for some other event through DePaul or something or, or with you, Lourdes. And so, you know, we had her come back and, and did a, you know, performance and reading, um, you know, with her and with Celia and, you know, it was just one of, one of the things we had was, which was really cool was a book club. And so we would get together. That was, there were a lot of offshoots from Amiga. There was Amiguitas, there were um, a book club, there was a, or, so there were all these other things that, you know, emanated from Amigas. One cool thing about the book club was that because it, it, we knew some of the lesbians who were writing these books, so we were able to invite them to the book club. And so we, I remember we had Achi Obejas come, we had Sheree Moraga, we had other Latinas who were queer writers, famous people who would agree, we'd reach out to them and they, if they were in Chicago, they would agree to come to our, you know, our homes and we would have these really cool discussions with, with these um, luminary lesbians who would come and, and chat with us. So that was really cool. cool. Yeah, so again, just, you know, filling the need of what, you know, what the women wanted and, um, you know, the other groups, Entre Familia was sort of P-Flag in Espanol and Aurora Pineda was, instrumental and I think with La Tony, Tony Alvarado, mm -hmm. right, to try to create space in a Spanish speaking group where, right, parents of queer Latino kids could talk about, you know, their kids. And, you know, the other group was uh, Madurando Elegantamente, which was for, you know, Latina queers over 60 that Mary okay. Torres, and there was uh, Amigas en la Fe, right, that I believe, you know, still exists, right, to sort of talk about spirituality and religion. So there were all these offshoots. That to me, there was uh, Dulce and, Palabra, remember oh, Dulce, Dulce Palabra, Palabra uh, again, which was um, for Latinas who were interested in performing performing and writing poetry and doing film. And they did some beautiful work. They did, they created films with uh, Linda Merchant made a film about Dulce Palabra, which is beautiful and every, I hope it's in part of the archive because there were a lot of the, of the amigas who were um, writers, who were artists and they had an opportunity to create their own space. They would meet again, uh, on their own, you know, every month and they'd have performances, which were really cool. And I, I, that's just another beautiful um, offshoot of Amigas Latinas. So we can move on to, so we have this slide because we just love this flyer um, of the Leaping Lesbians. But then we can actually also, um, we can move on to the, uh, the slide after that, which is about the Dyke March. And um, my question for that was how many years did Amigas Latinas participate in the Dyke March? And like any observation, observations you guys had of the parade over the years and like what neighborhoods it was in, um, how, how that went. Yeah, this picture isn't from the Dyke March. So this is from Pride Parade. And I okay. think that Amigas from the beginning of its, you know, 1995 was marching because I remember when I marched with WACT in 1994. And then the next year when Amigas was formed, um, we would usually tag on with like the Lesbian Community Cancer Project. They would let us ride the float with them. Alma, the, uh, the, the men's group would let us um, um, you know, be on their float. And it maybe wasn't until maybe the fifth or sixth year that we actually had folks that helped sponsor um, our floats and that. But it was really important because right again, you know, being in the pride parade, you know, Latinos would see us on the sidelines and go crazy when they would see us because, you know, we would have like every flag and the rainbow flag and here we are, right? Queer Latinas just like putting it out there and showing ourselves in that. And, and then the Dyke March, absolutely. You do the Dyke March on Saturday and you do the, you know, Pride Parade on Sunday. And the, you know, when the Dyke March went to Pilsen, I mean, that was a beautiful thing. And then in Humble Park, and so Amigas was always, you know, part of those. I mean, it was a way to really kind of be visible and really be out. And, 
And it would be great to have, I mean, that that float would just be bopping. I mean, there would be like, you know, 50 Latinas just, oh my God, it was amazing. It was amazing. We and some out. people participated in both of them, but remember the Dyke March was a much more political space. Absolutely. And yeah. so um, the Latinas and Latin, uh, Amigas Latinas were always on the board or on the organizing committee for the dike march, the dike march but, and some of some like uh event just mentioned some people marched in both some people thought that the queer the 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 regular march was too commercialized and it was all about sponsors and corporations right. so they were not interested at all in marching in that one so they did the dike march but most of us as i recall wanted a party in both of them <laughs> so we went to both of them we carried our political signs in the dike march and then we went and hung out on the um uh the the uh the float with amigas and dance so we, you could one could do both <laughs> and the next slide uh which is something that i personally really want to learn about is like how amiguita started yeah, I don't know if Zaida is still on. Um, yeah, yay. Um, yay. Yeah, so, you know, the early days of Amigas when we had the beepers, you know, the pagers, right? That's what you would call to find out about Amigas or get on the mailing list. There would be this young 14 year old uh, queer Latina who would call about Amigas. And, and if there was anything for, you know, young Latinas and Juanita and I would be like, oh my, you know, Juanita would be like, oh my God, she called again, Zaida called again, what are we going to do? Because at the time we thought, I don't know that, you know, looking back on it, it's interesting, right? Like we thought, well, we can't have her just come to the Vaticas, we're like grown women. And, and then it's like, well, so what? And, and yet, you know, we were all grown older women, like what, what would that mean for a, a queer teen, a Latina teen? And, and so then we, we met Zaida and we remember I met her at the Dyke March and then you know, we would march together and then she would be like, what are you going to do for, you know, younger Latinas, right? Because I guess we all look like the abuelas and tias, like, right? <laughs> and so, you know, we finally said, look, Zaida, you have to help us figure this out, right? And so she did. And we worked together and created, you know, the group that, that they chose the name Amiguitas that would meet. We partnered with Center on Halstead and, you know, Zaida was, you know, instrumental in that. We couldn't have done it without her. And it was another um, um, amazing thing that, you know, that Amigas was able to do. I think that's one of the reasons uh, Amigas lasted as long as it did. And 20 years is a pretty good run is because it was able to create all these subspaces or different spaces so um, everyone came to, or a lot of people came to the platicas and everyone came to the dances. But then people could, if they're interested in books, they could go to the book club. If they were younger, they could go to Amiguitas. If they spoke in Spanish, they could go to the Spanish platicas or the Spanish um, space that Mary Torres created. So it was just all this energy and all these different um, uh, communities that came together as Amigas Latinas, but that also had spaces to work on and think about and enjoy whatever a specific interest they had. So we can move on to our final slide. <laughs> um, and so I had a question initially about how like, I guess the, um, the transition from like social media, like in your later years, uh, from the handmade flyers um, and your beginnings, and I guess like what that was like. That that was my final question. I mean, Lourdes, you might have more to say about this, or maybe Alma. I know you're on um, Rosa. You know, I, I think when when we stepped off the board was sort of when social media was taking off. I mean, we had a website uh, at one point, um, but but this was all before sort of the Facebook stuff and, and even email and that, right? I mean, we, we sort of started using email. I remember Norma and I, when we were co-chairs would email a lot, but so my social media um, knowledge about it, I don't know, Lourdes, maybe you can speak to that or The, others, the or? sign right in here. So, so communication was really about visual. So the flyer, Yvette always did. The, the logo was really important. This this sign right here was made by Mercedes and Candy, I think. And I Mercedes think Corona. Corona. Yeah. They're in the back. They're there. in the back there. And so 
they were actually professional sign makers. <laughs> well, they're the ones that created the logo too. Not this, but the logo that you see. Right. So, so in some ways, we were blessed to have to have that. Um, but that that was the extent. Yeah, I mean, this is social yeah. media back in the days, right? You have a picnic with all these people and all these, you know, brown people like running around, and there's a sign that goes, "Oh, amigas latinas." Hey, wait a minute, right? Like, ooh, like. Amigas Latinas, and then you see the two, the double women symbol, and it's like, yeah, Amigas Latinas, right? <laughs> think about it. Yeah, I think it with time, as the new people join the organization and just the culture changes, and we're all um, participating in this transformation of social media, the, uh, the Amigas that were joining and working with us had savvy, the younger people especially, with the social media, so we were able to communicate with a larger audience through that medium. Although, you know, when we think about, uh, you know, uh, Amigas lasted 20 years and there's all kinds of theories when we ask people, why do you think, you know, it no longer exists? And, you know, one possible response, some people offer, there are many reasons that are offered, but one is that because we had social media, we had all these new avenues of of meeting Latina lesbians, of meeting Latina queers, that um, there were more spaces for people to connect. And so, um, you know, some people offer that as maybe um, partly responsible with, with um, that, that people didn't need that specific space anymore because there, all, or there were all these spaces um, opening up in, you know, in other, um, in, uh, in other places. There's also other reasons, I think, uh, you know, if we wanted to talk about the, um, you know, why it no longer exists. And, and if that always talks about, about some very um, severe losses we had, people that we lost who were on the board. Um, and that was also devastating. There was the fact that this was never a paid board, that we were all volunteers. And it was always difficult to get people to commit to doing this work free. Um, it, it is, uh, you know, a, a lot of work and no one can speak to that as well as Mona and Yvette who spent their whole lives doing this. But out of the, you know, the love of women, the love of the, our community, there was no paycheck at the end of the, of the week. So, um, you know, it's hard to find people, um, you know, who are willing to take on that, that huge responsibility. You know, let me say that, um, and I'm fascinated, Lourdes, that you ask people why they think Amigas ended. And I want to talk to you offline about that, because I always say I can tell you exactly why we ended. And um, not maybe why, well, why and when. And the way I say it is, um, you know, it, it and, and you're right, right? It's all of that, right? As, you know, when Amigas began in 1995, right, to 2015, so much had changed in the community where even though there are still women who are closeted, who are afraid to come out, right? We have a lot more freedoms, we have a lot more rights, we right the right to marry, all that sort of stuff. And I, I think in the third generation, um, and it's really hard to run a nonprofit. If you've never been in a nonprofit, you have no idea how hard it is, and especially a volunteer board. And it just got, I think, harder and harder to really keep the group going. And I remember the meeting, and I know Alma, if you're still on the call, you remember the meeting where we had sort of the come to Jesus conversation about then maybe it is time to end Amigas. Because as a women's group, we knew when to begin, we knew how to continue. So let's own our narrative and we make the decision of when it closes. And that's when it was decided that that's what we were gonna do on the 20th anniversary, right? Throw a kick-ass blowout party to go out in style at Michelle's ballroom. And that's what we did. And we divvied up the money that was left. We gave some to other queer POC groups to do that, right? Um, saved some of the money for the party, right? Had DJ Wanda. And, you know, so that's the story I tell, right, in my mind. And you're right, history again is, is and, and I think it is all that, but I always say that I can tell you exactly that Amigas made the decision to close. It wasn't just that we petered away right? Mm -hmm. That we just faded away. We had a blowout party. We, and we talk, remember, I'll never forget the end of that night when we said, this is it folks. Yeah. Enjoy. Let's go out, you know, in style. 
because again, as a women's group, it was so important. We knew how to start. We knew how to keep going. We then knew how to end. So to me, yeah. that's the story. But I want to hear what people tell you because I'm fascinated <laughs> by that question. <laughs> And maybe we can open up for the questions. I'm sorry that we went so long for everybody. And just that last uh, shout out for our project to, to continue if you want to participate and be a hand model for our, our potential um, you know, filming and photography with the, with the flyers and get a chance to know more of the flyers because we're going to recreate. Um, there's like, there are three binders, y'all don't know. There are three binders full of these events. And as, as, as Mona and Yvette stressed, this was monthly meetings that happened over 20 years. That is a massive undertaking on their part and now massive, massive undertaking on their, our part to like, rescan some more of these to uh, have you all interact with them and things. And so if you want to participate, you want to be a part of the project with our photography uh, group, uh, project with Amanda and I, there's the email amigasqueertime at gmail. Um, reach out. We'd love to, to get the ball rolling in the future and open up for questions if you want to talk Say hey, something. Ho hey, Jose, I hope you connect with Zaida. Zaida, I hope you connect with uh, Jose because, uh, you know, Zaida in high school did a film. Mm. And uh, so, you know, the I hope- Fish Almost Eaten by a Shark, was that it, Zaida? Or the no. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so uh, Zaida, I hope you, you two connect, okay? I just I just stopped the share, but I put the link in the chat. So th thank you all for for sharing that. I know you know we've met um, the five of us on test calls, and there's just so many stories, and it's just really wonderful to hear all the discussion. The chat's been great too. Um, thank you. I saw Diana dropped a few links to some groups that are still going now, but um, we did have a couple questions. The first one that came in was from Hinda about. Um, she was struck by Mona talking about how important art was to Amigas Latinas, and if you could talk a little bit more about that. And then I don't know if Luis and Amanda, if you want to talk about um, kind of some of your future projects you have going on that you're going to use Amigas for. Uh, so I think when I was talking about, although yes, art was important to Amigas Latinas, I think I was talking about it, in, about Yena. Uh, so in Yena, there were a, a lot of writers and visual artists. And so, although Lourdes is so right that we were very political, I didn't perceive us to be political, but when you talk about it, yes, claiming your art, claiming your voice is a political act of survival. And so I guess it depends who's in the group, right? And so in Iena, it was much more about poetry readings and it was about uh, being out, claiming your space and saying it outside and, and, and having an audience you know, who appreciated it. And so that, that was radical. It was so helpful, at least for me and my identity development at that time. Right, and for me as a social worker and the original sort of steering committee had a lot of sort of clinical social worker types, right? The thrust was a different then. So that the art for us came later as artists came in and wanted to use, right, Amigas as, as a space and an opportunity to, for spoken word and things like that. So. And then uh, Robert Castillo is on here, um, and he had a question about what uh, the legacy of Amigas was to you, what you view their legacy as. I get, you know, I guess you guys are going to be deciding that. <laughs> but I, you know what I would say? It's survival. You know, yeah. I, you know, I, Lourdes, I hear you saying that, you know, you know, we love the community. Yes, we did. But, you know, actually, it was about, for me at least, it was about trying to understand who I was as a Latina in a gay context in a white world, who I was as a mom, as a lesbian mom, raising uh, children who were brown. Um, and so for me, the legacy was, a, a, it was really about growing up in a healthy, healthy way, developing my identity in a way uh, that helped me survive the world that I live in now. I think for me, part of the legacy too is that there are, there's a whole swath of queer Latina women who are now everywhere, <laughs> right? Government, business, nonprofits, um, who continue to celebrate who they are. No apologies, no boundaries, no limitations. Um, yeah, to me, that's that's the legacy. And for oftentimes, me, I think oftentimes, oh, let me just say, oftentimes that Latinas do not have an opportunity to do leadership. 
in, in, in other organizations and other queer organizations. And Amigas offered the opportunity for each of us to, to develop leadership skills yeah. in ways that we would not have that opportunity. And so all the women who were uh, presidents are all leaders right now in the community. And, I, mm -hmm. and I, I can't help think that Amigas helped foster that. Yeah, that's good. That's why yeah. I think when a, uh, th this kind of event is so important and documenting this history and sharing it with other people, because I, I agree with everything Mona and Yvette said. What a beautiful example of living in a time when you, you're not allowed, you're not um, um, supposed to be who you are, but you make a space, you create a space to be able to, uh, to be visible, to be verbal, to co commune with other people who feel like you. So if something doesn't exist, you go out and you create it and you make it happen. That's a beautiful legacy for all of us in whatever spaces we are. If you don't see it, if you need it, then you build it. And I think that is an, incredible legacy that Amigas Latinas lives, uh, leaves to Chicago and to Latina lesbians everywhere. That's why we have to tell the story and use this material and get it out into the world because it matters, it should be shared. New generations should hear these stories and learn from it and create their own versions of you know, the reality that they wanna see in the world. Absolutely. And I was going to just, you've reminded me, speaking of stories, we have uh, Ari Mejia is on the call right now, and she's our producer that we've been working on a podcast called Unboxing Queer History. And March 1st, we will have an episode coming out about Amigas Latinas, where we had a conversation uh, with Yvette and Mona. So we're very excited. So we'll, sh we'll share that. We'll share more information um, in our newsletter and on our website. But just so you know that that's, that's coming up as well. You got to interview um, more people than just us. It yeah. is not. Just we, we, we need to do many more seasons is what we've learned <laughs> from this whole. Uh, that's a question. Chronicles. That was a question in the chat about how many women or how many people were in Amigas Latinas. Would you say yeah. some total, a guesstimation? That was a really well, good like question. Like I said, I mean, thought. the last mailing list I had, right, which was probably, you know, six, seven years before we closed had, you know, about 350 names. I don't know if that was given as one of the archive things, but I think I have that downstairs. I did find an extra box downstairs, but yeah, about three, but you know, who was sort of active? I don't know, 50 to a hundred. I mean, you have several women on, you know, today that, you know, were very active and, and most of them are, you know, former board members. So I think also uh, it was, you know, when we did the Proyecto Latina survey, we got over 300 people to fill it out. That was in 2007, which I think is amazing for any survey that was that long. We had like 100 questions that people actually filled that out and got that out there. Again, a lot of credit goes to Alicia Vega, who paid people to go out there and, you know, sit with people to actually fill out the survey. It was a real, uh, a long, uh, like a year long effort, which really paid off because we had all this great information that we were able to use to serve the community. So yeah, I think at different moments, there were uh, different people who were really involved and other people who were on the periphery. If you went by the dances, you would think that there were hundreds of people in Amigas Latinas because the dances always drew hundreds of people. And we threw some good yeah. parties. <laughs> we had good parties. We did. Mm -hmm. Next question. Watch yes, time. next question. So David, uh, David wanted to ask a question live. So David, I'm going to unmute you. All right, you are hey, unmuted. David. Uh, so hi, Mona and Yvette. Hey. Hi, hi Queens. Um, I just want to say first and foremost, this was really a really awesome and powerful dialogue. I knew of Amigas Latinas. I didn't know as much as I learned today. Um, and I think you all have just brought up so many different issues and social topics that like, I just would love to just to unpack one day. I'm gonna bother you for coffee one day. Um, you know, but as, you know, and, and it was just so important because I, I mean, as, as, a, as a current, someone who's active in the community now, you know, on the board of ALVA, thinking about um, what space are we creating for as being Latinas even today, right? Because uh, even today, lesbian Latinas uh, still need space, right? Um, and even queer youth and 
you know, just hearing how you all organize in a different way that you've gathered, you know, your resources and information was just really powerful. But I was thinking about, and I was just curious about, what do you now know today about archiving that you wish you knew then in the beginning of Amigas Latinas? One thing is putting the year on all the flyers so we know when things happened. <laughs> I didn't do that to all of them, huh? Yeah. But but they're in the notebook in order, though. <laughs> they, that, so Joe. That's right. So if you got them out of order, that's your problem. That's right. <laughs> they were in order. They were in order. Yeah, did you find the notebook first, then? <laughs> yeah. I sure wish we had the cloud back then, right? I mean, I have disks. I have floppy disks, right, with budgets and flyers and notes and minutes and. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's a question I think for the archivists. What what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And we have a uh, wit wit is on the call right now. I know wit has done a lot of work with the Amigas Latinas collection. And I know for me, something that's really interesting going through is when people take the time to put the names of who's in photos and the year that's so important. And mm -hmm. I know we've talked about having, you know, some sort of a meetup where we can go through the photos together to figure out, you know, who's in them have more context to the photos so that that information can can stay with those those visual elements as well. Um, right, and I, remember, not all those women were out, right? So exactly. there were some platica shots, or you know, they they the, the challenge is they were not out, they were they are no longer out, <laughs> or they broke up, and uh, you know, so it's like no, nope, no, nope, you can't show that picture with those two because you know, and then this one, and that, yeah, yeah. So, but you know, I, I mean, David, I I had no idea. This blows me away. I hope for other amigas and old board members. Like the fact that there are artists that are going to use the Amigas archives to do art blows my mind and almost brings me to tears. I had no idea when we were doing Amigas, right, that now, seven years later, right, that it still lives on in this way. And I, I'm just, I can't wait to see like what it means to create the art, but then it, looking at the flyers, I see that the flyers in themselves become pieces of art because it just isn't done like that anymore. And you know, we were just trying to get the information out, but in a safe way to make sure that, you know, again, the privilege and power and honor to be in, invited into a woman's home, right? At a time when it wasn't as safe as maybe it is now. And yet, you know, it was revolutionary that we were talking about our sexuality, about our sex, about who we are as Latinas and not apologizing. And, you know, we weren't doing anything wrong. We were just celebrating who we were. But the fact that this is happening, that the art, I'm just, I can't tell you, I'm just, it just brings me to tears, it just brings me to tears. Can't wait to see what you guys all do. And, you know, and I know like Robert Castillo, he's got tons of stuff. You need to talk to him too. I, you know, and anybody else who has stuff, be it the stories or, you know, there's the dog tags we had when the gay games happened, yeah. right? There's the base. I, it's just, it's, it's, yeah, it's, I'm really, I'm really humbled today. And Amanda, I, I love that photograph that you did, or, or just the way you're cropping the photos and making them a different type of art is really beautiful. So I, I want to congratulate you for that. Just seeing a little bit, you just showed us a couple, but it was really powerful to see what you can do by using those materials in a different way and focusing our, our attention. I love that with the hands and it's just beautiful. So uh, I can't wait to see what both of you do with your art and you know how Amigas Latinas continues to live on in this beautiful way. Thank you so much. I just, I wanna thank all of you. We have, we have one last question I'll read out, but you know, clearly I think we need to have more events to talk through, um, especially, you know, so we'll release this episode in March and I think we'll plan some more events about Amigas Latinas after that to discuss more. Um, but thank you all for, for, for talking. Um, and the last question is just, you know, when, especially during this time when meeting in person has been so difficult, uh, the question was from Maria Calderon. Um, are there any sort of virtual picnics, plecticas, any sort of virtual spaces you could recommend to kind of keep connections going, like we're, what, what happened with Amigas Latinas? I, I, I thought you um, said that somebody had posted some links in the chat on things that are happening. Yep, there were a few, few links to current groups. Uh, Diana posted a few like WACT and, and a few other groups as well. 
And maybe people will be inspired to start their own yeah. now from yeah. what they've learned from Amiga. Hey, there's a need and there are lots of people on this call and there will be a lot of people who are interested in participating, I think, in a virtual space that brings us together. So somebody get inspired and do it. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think the virtual space is, you know, we have a much greater appreciation and understanding for how it can work. Mm -hmm. So the thought of a sort of an Amiga Satinas kind of virtual thing where you can connect with really women around the world, um, you know, is really, you know, kind of blows me away to think about that when I think of, you know, standing at the Xerox machine and licking them damn envelopes and putting stamps on them, running to the post office to get them in the box so that women can get it in time for the next plastic app. So don't know, Maria, you know, do it, do yeah. it. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you, Amanda and Luis, for starting this conversation, you know, a few months ago. And Lourdes, Mona, Yvette, thank you so much for talking. Um, we'll, you know, please sign up for our newsletter, check our Facebook and Instagram. We'll send out information when this uh, recording goes up. Um, but thank you all for coming. It means a lot. And thank you again to Amigas Latinas for choosing Gerber Heart for your archives. It means a lot to us. Thank you, everybody. Yay. Thank you. Thank you.